This afternoon's scripture is from Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, all the way through Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And then Peter responded to him, See, we have left everything and followed you, so what will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or fields, because of my name, will receive a hundred times more, and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the workers on one denarius, he sent them into his vineyard for the day. When he went out about nine in the morning, he saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I'll give you whatever is right. So off they went. About noon and about three, he went out again and did the same thing. Then about five, he went and found others standing around and he said to them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they said to him. You also go into my vineyard, he told them. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard told his foreman, call the workers and give them their pay, starting with the last and ending with the first. When those who were hired, came about, when those who were hired about five came, they each received one denarius. So the ones who came first, they assumed they'd get more, but they also received one denarius each. And when they received it, they began to complain to the landowner, these last men put in one hour and you made them equal to us who bear the burden of the day's work and the burning heat. And he replied to them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Didn't you agree with me on one denarius? Take what's yours and go. I want to give to this last man the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Are you jealous because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first last. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Amanda. All right, it's good to see everybody tonight. Let me ask, if you're here for the first time tonight, could you lift your hand and let us welcome you? Right, yeah, all over the place, over here, over here in this room, yep, on this side, yes, all right, great. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We welcome you to our family, and we hope you will consider TIF, hopefully soon in the future, to be your family as well. We have a special guest with us tonight, Georgie Day. Georgie, right here. See, you are still remembered. Georgie's one of the founding members of Taichung International Fellowship. She was with us at the very beginning and has been in Australia for the last few years, going to seminary and preparing to be a missionary. And she just arrived back in Taiwan. And she's going to be working with Cornelius, our Indonesian pastor. She's been with him some in Australia, and he's coming soon. We hope <laughs> he's working on it. Uh, but she's going to be working with uh, the Indonesian uh, migrant workers, and we're so excited that you're with us tonight. And I know you won't be here every week, but any week that you're available, we want you to be here, and we welcome you back to Taiwan. It's great to see you. All right, so tonight we are looking at the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And the context of this story is what helps us really understand what is going on. So if you don't get the context, then you're not going to understand the parable that Jesus is telling. So in Matthew 19, I didn't read all of the context, but let me just back you up a little bit. People are bringing children to Jesus for him to bless. And the disciples rebuke 
them. They, they stop the children from coming to Jesus and say, don't bother the master. Don't bother Jesus with these children. But Jesus actually says, no, 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 let the little children come unto me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And then right after that, we have the encounter with what is known as the rich young ruler. Do you remember this encounter with Jesus? So there's a a wealthy young man who comes to Jesus and wants to know what he must do to get eternal life. And what Jesus says is you need to sell your possessions, give everything to the poor, and come and follow me. And the man walks away from Jesus grieving because he's unwilling to do what Jesus has asked him to do. And Jesus says to the disciples at that point, how hard it is for a rich person to enter heaven, that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Friends, that statement ought to be pretty shocking to all of us because comparatively in the world, I would say most of us are rich. Most of us are wealthy. So Jesus says it's hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. But he does say, With God, all things are possible. It is possible with God, with God's help. So Jesus tells his disciples, listen, there's a contrast here. Children who have nothing but childlike faith are close to the kingdom of God. But wealthy people who rely on their own resources, who rely on themselves, are far away from God. The disciples were shocked by this because they were sure At that time, it it was a common way of thinking, and frankly, even today we tend to think this way, that if you appear to be blessed by God, and we think that the appearance of blessing is the appearance of wealth. So we think if you have things, if things are going well for you in your life, that that means that God is blessing you. And so the disciples thought, well, the rich young ruler, the man who had it all together, certainly if anybody was going to heaven, it was that young man. And we tend to think that way today. We tend to think that people who have the appearance of blessing on them, that they must be favored by God. And Peter opens his mouth, and he says, listen, we've left everything and followed you. Peter's worried about this now. He's saying, wait a second, if, if this rich young ruler, the man who appeared to have it all together, if he's not getting into heaven or doesn't appear to have any hope, then what about us? We've left everything to follow you, and, and what about us? And Jesus says, listen, don't worry. In the kingdom of God, in God's economy, everything's going to be sorted out. But let me tell you a story. I love that Jesus does this for us over and over again. When he wants to illustrate something for us, he uses this way of teaching us. And he says, let me tell you a story. The kingdom of God is like. So that's the setup for this parable. The kingdom of God is like. And so Jesus uses the illustration of the landowner and the workers in the vineyard. So to sum it up, the land or the foreman at the end of this story pays the day laborers in reverse from the last people who came to the first people who came. And unexpectedly, the ones who came last at 5 p.m. get paid one denarius, a full day's wage. That was what the people who signed up at the very beginning of the day at 6 a.m. agreed to work for, for the whole day, 12 hours. Have you ever had something unexpected like that happen to you? Where you got more than you deserved? It's a good feeling, isn't it? Yeah, it's a really good feeling. And that's what happened to these guys. They were, they were really excited. So... Naturally, those who worked more, the people who worked all day, when they witnessed this, they saw the foreman handing out this wage of one denarius for an hour's work, they immediately started calculating in their heads, well, I worked 12 hours, so one times 12 is 12 denarius, I'm going to get 12 days work. 
or 12 days pay for one day's work, this is a really good deal. But that's not what happened. They got paid the same. They got paid the same. Let me give you an example. Uh, Melody's here. Melody owns a cram school, a bushy van, okay? And so I'm sorry, I didn't tell you I was going to do this, but I, I am going to do it, all right? I've already started, it's too late. So Jordan works for Melody's uh, school. And uh, is Jordan a good employee, by the way, Melody? <laughs> all right. Okay, that's, that's good to know. All right, so Jordan uh, has, has worked for Melody for a while now, and uh, I think Jordan gets paid a good wage. Jordan, do you agree you get paid a good wage? <laughs> we'll let you sort that out later. Okay, so Jordan gets paid. He works a full, out, full week, and that's great. Imagine if tomorrow somebody showed up well, actually, we do have the situation. Robert is going to start working for Melody a couple of hours a week, right? Okay. Imagine if Robert and Jordan ended up in the break room at Melody's workplace, and they're talking, and Robert's just working a couple of hours a week. Jordan's working, I don't know, 18 hours a week, something like that. And they start talking, and, and uh, Robert says, boy, I really love this place. And Jordan says, really? I mean, I like it, but, you know, it's, a, it's okay. <laughs> and uh, Robert says, no, no, no. Melody is a great boss. I mean, she pays well. And Jordan says, what do you mean she pays well? And he says, well, I only work two hours, but I get paid for 18 how do you think Jordan would feel? A little salty. Yeah, salty, that's right. <laughs> yeah. If you don't know what salty means, look it up in the Urban Dictionary, okay? <laughs> would you think that Melody treated them fairly? No. That's the point of this parable. Let me ask you a question. Is God fair? Be careful with your answer. Is God fair? If you are the Laborer, remember Jesus said the kingdom of God is like this. Did the owner of the field treat the laborers fairly? No, he did not. No, he did not. If you study the Bible, and if some of you are interested in doing this, you can do it later. You could look through the whole Bible for the idea of the word fair as it relates to being fair. Like, you know, you have uh, children, and I imagine Andy and Stephanie, you guys, fi do you guys fix breakfast? Are you breakfast eaters? You're not breakfast eaters. Don't you know children need a good breakfast? <laughs> All right, uh, nippers, do you guys eat breakfast? Okay, the nippers, the nippers eat breakfast. All right, thank, thank goodness somebody eats breakfast around here. All right, sorry, Andy, we'll talk about this at elders meeting. Uh, so the nippers eat breakfast. Now you've got three girls, and let's just decide you decide to fix pancakes one morning, okay? And... What's fair? Everybody gets the same number of pancakes, right? So if you decide everybody gets three pan everybody gets three pancakes. But is that the right thing to do for your girls? Three pancakes each? Who eats the most girls tell us the truth? Who eats the most pancakes? <laughs> oh, okay, all right. I got it. Okay. And we won't we won't make you name names or anything. Yeah, fair is uh, an interesting concept. So in the Bible, actually, 
the idea of fairness is only mentioned five times. And it is never mentioned in relationship to God. Never. Does that surprise you? It probably surprises some of you. All right, we'll come back to this. I think one of the great qualities of a story like this, a parable, the reason Jesus uses parables is that because it's just, it's just an everyday story, just like I told you the story about Melody and, and Jordan and Robert, it's something everybody can t- attach onto and, and, and grab onto really easily. It sneaks past our defenses and grabs onto our hearts and helps us realize a deep truth that we really need to know. And it has a way of revealing something true about ourselves as well. So let's see what the scripture wants to reveal about us tonight. I think one of the things that it wants to reveal about us tonight is our own attitude about salvation. Okay, that's the first point. I think the parable, the story Jesus is trying to tell, is trying to reveal to us our attitude about salvation. In the parable, all the workers were going to go hungry unless they were hired. But the landowner chose some of the workers. He didn't choose all the workers. He chose some to work for him. Some worked a full day, some for part of a day, and some for only an hour. But every one of them was given a denarius, more than enough to live on, a day's wage. In the end, the landowner actually paid more generously than he was required to do. In the same way, not no one is born a believer. No one is born a believer. Listen, if I sit down with you and I ask you, how did you become a Christian? If you, if you think your answer is something like this, well, I was born into a Christian family, that's the wrong answer. That's not, that doesn't make you a Christian. You don't become a Christian because your parents were Christians. You become a Christian because you yourself enter into a relationship because God calls you into a relationship with himself. Some come to Jesus when they're young, some come when they're teenagers, some come when they're tw- in their 20s, and some people come to Jesus when they're in their 70s or 80s. Some people come to Jesus right before they're going to die, just like the thief on the cross who died next to Jesus. But every single person who comes to Jesus receives eternal life, full eternal life, not partial life, full eternal life. Some of you came to faith early in life. Some of you came to faith in Christ as a child. Some of you came to faith later in life. But if you're one of those people who came to faith early in life, are you offended by God's grace towards those who came later Do you feel like you deserve a bigger reward because you got it sooner? Like the workers in the vineyard who worked all day? If if you find yourself bitter or resentful like the workers in the parable, then it shows that we that you believe or that we believe that in some way we've earned our salvation and deserve a reward. But the reality is it's an undeserved gift. Salvation is an undeserved gift. We've received much more than we deserve. And our response is to be gratitude. Paul says it like this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We're saved by what Jesus has done, not by what we've done. So if we really understand the gospel, if it really works its way down into our hearts, we we don't we don't have any bitterness or envy towards those who come to faith later on. Secondly, it reveals our attitude towards the walk of faith, towards the walk of faith. 
Verse 12 says, these men who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. The workers who came early saw it as unfair that they had worked the whole day and not earned any more than the ones who worked one hour. We may think the same thing about the life of faith when we think about our commitment to God. Some of you may feel like you've been giving and sacrificing for years and years and years while other people have got to have fun living the life that they wanted to live. Living it up and doing what they please. If this is how you feel, what does this reveal about your attitude towards the life of faith, towards knowing God and following Jesus? Let me ask you this question. What if you knew, what if you somehow knew that you would die exactly five years from today? What if that knowledge was somehow made available to you right now that you were going to die five years from today? You're going to drop dead. If you knew the day that you were going to die, how would that affect the way that you would live? Would that change the way that you live? Would you live it up? Go out and max out all your credit cards? Go buy a real fancy car? Eat all you want? Live a wild life with men or women? Or would you look at it as an opportunity to commit your life to serving God even more deeply than you've ever done before? In other words, do you see a life of faith as a privilege or a chore? Do you see your walk with God as a privilege or a chore? Look at the attitude of the workers in the vineyard. They're filled with envy. They saw it as unfair that they had to work the whole day for one denarius and the others worked only for an hour. Remember what Jesus said? The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Knowing Jesus and following him is life to the fullest. If you don't feel that way, if you don't really believe that, then you don't know him very well. You don't know how good he is, or you've forgotten how good he is. Oftentimes, those who come to faith later in life usually look back and regret the way they lived when they were younger, wishing they had come to faith sooner, because they know that the consequences of sin remain far after the thrill of sin is gone. Thirdly, it reveals our attitude towards God. Verses 9, 10, and 11 say this. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Going on, these men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them saying, friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Those men grumbled against the landowner because they thought he was unfair. They had forgotten that without the landowner hiring them, they would have had nothing. If the landowner hadn't brought them in to work, they would have ended up with nothing. They would have still been standing on the street corner. Furthermore, they forgot that the landowner gave them more than they deserved and instead chose to focus on the men who had received more than they deserved. The landowner may have shown the workers who were hired at the 11th hour more grace, but that doesn't change the fact that he also showed grace to those hired first. Listen, do you live your life? Well, let me ask it this way. Do you think God owes you? Do you live your life thinking that if you're good or if you obey that God owes you a blessing? Do you get resentful if he doesn't answer prayer because you've been good? 
Do you grumble against God when others who have not been half as faithful as you receive incredible blessings or healing while you seem overlooked? Let me ask those questions again, okay? Don't just pass over this. Let's really think about it tonight. Let's let our hearts be examined. Do you think God owes you? Sometimes I do. Do you live your life thinking that if you're good or if you obey God, that he owes you a blessing? I've thought that way before. I thought, why is this happening to me? I follow God. Do you get resentful if he doesn't answer a prayer because you've been good? I've felt that way before. Do you grumble against God when others who've not been half as faithful as you receive incredible blessings or healing while you are seemingly overlooked? You faithfully spend time in prayer and yet you're still single? You serve in the church and yet somebody else gets healed and you don't? This parable reveals that many of us believe that God owes us for our faithfulness or our goodness. And we can become just as resentful underneath, as angry as the day laborers when God does not give us what we think we deserve. But the truth is God owes us nothing. God is no one's debtor. We can't place him under our obligation Everything we experience is pure grace. It's pure grace. Luke 17 says this, Which one of you, having a servant, tending sheep or plowing, will say to him when he comes in from the field, Come at once and sit down to eat? Instead, will he not tell him, Prepare something for me to eat, get ready, and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you can eat and drink. Does he thank that servant because he did what he was commanded? In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Even Jesus comes out at one point and says, listen, you're unworthy servants. God owes you nothing. All is grace. The point is, of the parable, is that we have to realize, in the parable, who are we? We're the people standing on the side of the road waiting to be hired. We're the people on the side of the road waiting to be hired. And unless the landowner chooses us, we've got nothing. Then it's all grace. It's a good gift that God has given us to be called into his kingdom. Paul put it like this in Romans chapter 11. He says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This parable may have been a simple lesson, but the way Jesus tells it accomplishes so much more. It acts like a mirror that we hold up to ourselves so we can look at our heart, revealing our attitudes towards salvation. Are you a worker to whom God owes blessings and reward? Or are you the one who is separated from God? in need, with nothing to offer, but nevertheless chosen by the God of the universe and blessed even though you did not deserve it? Do you look at God as a boss who owes you a paycheck for your work? Or is he a loving and merciful father who has saved you, chosen you, adopted you, died for you, to whom you owe everything? Are you willing to live in God's kingdom under his authority or do you need to take the credit for your life and work? This is not a theological question. This is practical. It's a question about how you live your life. What thought or what thoughts fill your heart day by day? 
Remember, as I said at the beginning, this story comes right after Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler, the model Christian, so to speak, successful, affluent, with status. From a religious point of view, this guy had it all. And Jesus' challenging call to him was, yes, You are a God-fearing person, but I call you to stop living in the way the world asks you to live and start living the way I call you to live, not depending on yourselves. And Jesus says to Peter and the other disciples, listen, you're offended by my response to this young man, but let me tell you about my kingdom where I am the king. In my kingdom, it's upside down. When you see this story, or when you read the Bible, and let me, here, here's how you can kind of figure out where you are tonight. You read the story, and you get to the part where the, the workers who were hired last say to the foreman, what? You're paying, or the, I'm sorry, the the workers who were hired first say to the workers who were hired last, or to the foreman, what, you're paying us the same as you paid them? Down deep in your heart, do you look at that and do you go, yeah, exactly, how could he do that? That's reasonable. Or in a few weeks, we'll talk about the story of the prodigal son, right? And at the end of the story of the prodigal son, what happens? The older brother comes back, and the older brother comes, and he's angry, and he says, how dare you throw this party for the, my younger sibling who ran off and spent all your money and wasted it, and now you're treating him like nothing happened. What about me? When you read that story, do you, do you identify with that guy? Do you go, yeah, what about me? That'll tell you where your heart is. Final question. Do you need God to be fair? Do you need God to be fair? This brings us to the Lord's table. We're about to take the Lord's Supper. And as we come to this table, the question or the thought that I would pose to you is, what is your response? As you receive the body of the representation of the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope your response is gratitude for the most unfair act in all of human history. Because it was not fair that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died for you. Fair would be for you to pay the punishment for your sins. That's fair. Do you want God to be fair? I think if you really get to the bottom of it, I don't think any of us wants God to be fair. We want God to be loving and righteous and just and we want him to accept us based on Jesus sacrifice and that's what the Lord's table this supper this communion represents for us tonight as you hold the bread in your hand as you hold the cup with that red juice in your hand you remember that's the point of the ceremony you remember the sacrifice Let me invite the ushers to go ahead and come forward. You remember 
what has been spilled for you, Jesus' blood. You remember what has been broken for you, Jesus' body, on your behalf. And it is unfair. It's unfair that you get to receive the grace of God. But it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. And so our response is gratitude. Our response is thankfulness. Can you imagine how those men who were paid first, who just worked for an hour, must have felt? A denarius. But we just worked an hour. I imagine some of them said that. We, we just worked an hour. And you're giving us a day's pay? As you hold the juice and the bread in your hand, I hope that's your response. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve the sacrifice that Jesus has made on my behalf. Thank you, Lord. Thank you.